Howdy. Let's have a listen quickly to this. Welcome to Lesson 10, the Swiss Alps. If you're not familiar with the Alps, it's a very famous chain of mountains in Switzerland. These mountains have been studied for hundreds of years. They're the classic type location of studies in structural geology. And it's just really because these mountains are so darn confusing and there's so much rock to see. If you look at the rocks in the Swiss Alps, they're all twisted and deformed and basically just confusing. You really need to map them in huge amounts of detail for further study before you can even touch the subject. And that's exactly what geologists of ancient times did. Not that ancient, the 1800s anyway. And so we'll look at one fellow in particular, Hans Conrad Escher von der Lind. It rolls right off the tongue. He was a great geologist and he studied the Alps in great detail. One of the biggest findings that he had and that we'll look at is known as the glarus thrust. We have to remember that geologists at this time didn't have the same tools as we have today. They couldn't date rocks radiometrically, so they couldn't come up with absolute dates. They could, they could relatively date rocks, so they could, from cross-cutting relationships in outcrops, find that one set of rocks is younger or older than another set of rocks. So that was something. They were at least clever and resourceful more than anything. They also didn't have any sort of mechanism of how all these rocks in the Alps got all twisted, deformed, and folded. It was sort of a mystery. There were some theories, but they weren't particularly convincing. And so what they did, in essence, was just trek through the Alps. Some of these great geologists, Escher von der Linth and uh, Albert Heim and Edward Seuss, they, they would trek through the Alps. And this was a really physically demanding ordeal. They'd trek through the Alps, map the rocks and the units that they were looking at very precisely, offices, so that they could actually sort of study a 3D representation. Let's go a bit forward. The entire puzzle. And that is that the rocks below are young rocks. The rocks above, which are a different type of rock, are old rocks. Now this violates Steno's law of superposition. You remember that? We went over that in one of the early lectures. And that was just that old rocks, when formed in traditional settings, like a sedimentary setting, should be older. So you get the old rocks on the bottom, and then progressively you build up more rock that's younger on top. So you get young rocks on top, old rocks below. But the glarus thrust was the opposite to this. The young rocks, the most recently formed, were underneath, and the old rocks were on top. Which is impossible. <laughs> yeah, it might indicate <clears throat> that their theory is wrong in the first place. And I have been talking about mountains being weather petrified. And this is a collage I made some time ago, where we have a circle, a triangle, and another shape, whatever shape it is. And obviously on the left we have clouds, and on the right we have just landscape. And then we have things which repeat themselves. And then we have to understand that we are connected to the sun all the time. Take an unprecedented look into a central engine powering a massive solar flare July 28, 2020. Earth to scale.
Observation of a large solar flare on September 10th, 2017 in extreme ultraviolet grayscale background by NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory and microwave. Microwave red to blue indicate increasing frequencies observed by the expanded Owens Yali Solar Array. Light orange curves are selected magnetic field lines from the matching theoretical solar eruptive flare model. The flare is driven by the eruption of a twisted magnetic flux rope illustrated by a bundle of color curves, a Birkeland current. Microwave sources are observed throughout the central region where a large-scale reconnection current sheet, the flare's central engine, is located and are used to measure its physical properties. So that's the picture. Earth to scale. And I think it could be possible that the Alps got formed like that. This would also explain why we have old rocks on top and younger tops on the bottom. Because, as I tried to explain many times, like in the recent videos, drawing some lightning bolts on top of a hill or a mountain or a fulgurite with a darkened color, it got burned. And so if you have this kind of huge electromagnetic discharge, the rocks on top, they are much more exposed to heat and radiation which alters the material, they not only get burned and whatever, they're also microwaved and all kinds of other radiation things. So they get altered in the moment they are like built while the process, they got so much altered that they look in the common geological timeline, radiocarbon dating and all these kind of things. They look immediately really, really old because they got altered so much through radiation, which is something really important to somehow remember that if we have this kind of electromagnetic discharge event, it's not only hot, it's not only really noisy, it's not only really violent, it's not only really windy, It's also really radiation full. There's all kinds of radiation, really strong radiation. Like if you ever, ever, ever have been welding, arc welding, you know that you have to wear this protection material. Otherwise you get a sunburn. Your skin will fall off and your eyes gonna be blind next day because of the radiation. That's why the Alps are so, so much more altered than the Jura Massif, which is in the north. And the granite of which the Alps are made is the metamorphosed equivalent to rhyolithic lava. And rhyolithic lava is very rich in silica. And obviously, there is some paper now which talks about exactly silica. How geomagnetic activity is really tied, or how silica reacts much easier to this geomagnetic activity. There are many mineral springs and many geothermal activity hotspots in the Alps region. Rhyolithic lava, and we have cryptodomes. At least one thunder mountain. There's like so much rhyolithic rock there and also so much granite. Hence, the rhyolite came out of the ground and the granite was the one which rose up to the hill and got burned and turned into granite. 
and then it stopped. The event was over. You got the Alps, mountains and valleys created simultaneously. Still water pouring out. Some of it is frozen, hence glaciers. So if the electromagnetic environment is changing, you could probably expect all those wells what you have in the mountains where is water pouring out in a small stream or you have those glaciers which are lava streams made out of water contemporary lava streams maybe the most gentle or not so if there is a change in the electromagnetic environment which is going on at the moment with all those weather things going on and earthquake swarms in the Alps and these kind of things north magnetic north pole is changing some five miles a month probably just increasing in speed 11 months until we reach the weak field lines and things start to increase in speed Probably really quickly. Everybody knows how a magnet works. If you have two magnets, let's say they are attracting magnets, of course. And if you keep them far away enough, there is nothing going on. Nothing visible. You don't feel anything. But if you go closer, slowly closer, there will once be the point where it will accelerate and they stuck together in the blink of an eye. This is how magnet works. This is something really important to grasp if you think about Earth magnetic North Pole shifting to some other place. Actually, we might have to check out this one buoy, what is going on, because approximately here is the location of the new magnetic North Pole. And there is still some activity going on. Really interesting. So, with this being said, let's have a quick look at our predominant hotspot of earthquakes in the Alps at the moment. 30 minutes ago, one hour. Still going on, going strong. One hour. Let's see if there's anything which could indicate that there <clears throat> has been some kind of an eruption once at least. Maybe this one I could count this as one of those places. I think there could be really well a possibility for the past eruption. There is somehow a deeper trench and the whole area is from different color. Yeah, we don't do much with this map. Why not? Could be possible. Let's just check quickly out if there's anything 
really interesting. And I think there are houses there up in the mountains. And I don't believe <clears throat> that those people get their water down in the valley and carry it up there. So there might be a spring there, really close or in the house. I would say. But it's really interesting to have this kind of activity in the Alps going on at the moment. One hour ago. Let's just check this out quickly. Is there anything? Except that there is water rain, a big one, which is white. The white rivers, another mystery, which is in a way is now obvious, which is not a mystery anymore. Just in case, if you don't know what I mean. A white river. Where are those big ones? Where are we? Here. White rivers. And you find them all over the place. They are everywhere. And not just in the Alps. And that's not snow. These are white rivers. Rhyolithic lava or something. But anyway, I leave it here. <clears throat> Earthquake activity in the Alps, really interesting. Thanks. Bye.